welcome to Chiropractic Science, where you get to hear interviews with leading chiropractic researchers from around the world. Hear about chiropractic research from the authors in plain English, not through the media, nor a middleman. My name is Dr. Dean Smith, and I am the host of Chiropractic Science. I'm a clinical professor in the Department of Kinesiology and Health at Miami University in Ohio, and I'm also a chiropractor in Eaton, Ohio. My research interests relate to understanding how chiropractic affects motor control and human performance. Today, I have the privilege of interviewing Dr. Michael Freeman. But before we get to the interview, I wanted to thank all of you who have subscribed to Chiropractic Science, and I'm especially appreciative to all of you who have contributed five-star reviews on iTunes. iTunes helps others find out about chiropractic and chiropractic science. So if you like the show, please take a second and write a review. It will support us everywhere. Here's a review from Dr. Katie Benson. She says, a great resource. I always look forward to new episodes. This podcast breaks down research in an interesting and easily digestible form. It's my favorite way to stay up to date on chiropractic research. Thanks, Dr. Smith. Well, thank you, Dr. Katie Benson, for your review, and I look forward to sharing your iTunes review in a future podcast. Please consider making a contribution to chiropractic science to keep these podcasts going. You can do so on our website either by making a donation or by purchasing the evidence-based patient education slides presentation at chiropracticscience.com. All right, on to the podcast. Well, let's get on to the interview with Dr. Michael Freeman. Dr. Michael Freeman is a consultant in forensic medicine and as such is a member of the Faculty of Forensic and Legal Medicine, FFLM, of the Royal College of Physicians in the United Kingdom. He has provided expert testimony for more, more than 1,200 times in a wide variety of civil and criminal cases, including injury and death litigation, automotive and other product liability, toxic tort litigation, life expectancy, and medical negligence cases, as well as in homicide, assault, and other criminal matters. Dr. Freeman has published around 220 scientific papers, books, and book chapters, primarily focusing on issues relating to forensic applications of epidemiology and general and specific causation. Research and publication topics include traffic crash-related injury and death, injury biomechanics and injury causation, genocide, cancer epidemiology, chronic pain mechanisms, and adult autologous stem cell therapy, among others. Dr. Freeman is co-editor and co-author of the authoritative text on forensic applications of epidemiology, and that's called Forensic Epidemiology, Principles and Practice, published in 2016. His published three-step approach has been adopted by U.S. courts as a generally accepted injury causation methodology, as described in the 2016 10th Circuit U.S. DCA Etherton decision. Dr. Freeman is a tenured associate professor of forensic medicine and epidemiology at Maastricht University Medical Center and a joint clinical professor of psychiatry and public health and preventive medicine at Oregon Health and Science University School of Medicine. He is a fellow of the American College of Epidemiology and the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. Dr. Freeman is a past Fulbright fellow with the U.S. Department of State in the area of forensic medicine and holds a Diploma of Legal Medicine with FFLM in the United Kingdom. Dr. Freeman holds a Doctor of Medicine degree from Umea University in Sweden and a PhD and Master's in Public Health in Epidemiology from Oregon State University, a Master's of Forensic Medical Sciences with the Academy for Forensic Medical Sciences in the UK, a Doctor of Chiropractic from what is now the University of Western States, and a Bachelor of Science from the U University of Oregon. He completed a two-year fellowship in forensic pathology from Umea University and the Allegheny County Office of the Medical Examiner. Dr. Freeman, thanks so much for coming on the Chiropractic Science Podcast. Well, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Well, that's great. We've, I know we've got a lot of things uh, to talk about. You've had an amazing career uh, and you're, uh, you're just, you just keep going. And so I'm super excited to have you on and learn about, uh, some of the things that you've been up to over the years. And the first question I usually like to ask on the podcast is how did you become interested first in, in becoming a chiropractor? And then you've gone on to do so many things. So, uh, perhaps we can also talk about how you got then into research and, and becoming a medical doctor as well. Well, sure. Um, 
Well, chiropractic was what I was raised around. My dad's a chiropractor. So um, he's, let's see, 90 this year and still practices five days a week. Wow. Uh, and um, when I was, he was, he went to what at the time was Western States Chiropractic College um, in Portland. Um, and when I was born, uh, I was delivered by a chiropractor. <laughs> because he was in his, I think he was in his maybe first year or second year there. First year, I think. Um, and and obstetrics it was, and I think is still part of the Chiropractic um, Practice Act. And so, um, uh, I, I, it's what I grew up around. It was not something that um, I mean. I I didn't go to other doctors. Uh, I just saw my dad when when you know I had something something wrong with me. And so um, I went through uh, went to college and then went to chiropractic school and started out practicing with practicing with him. And I. I practiced for 12 years with my dad. It was really, it was really great. Wow. That's awesome. I, so yeah, I didn't know that you were in practice lot that long. Can you tell me j just a little bit about your practice uh, at the time? What, did you specialize at all or did you have a general practice? Well, I started getting into research about four years or five years after I was in practice um, and then worked on my master's and PhD while I was practicing. So my my practice sort of gravitated towards my PhD uh, interest, which was traffic crash related injuries, which of course, is, as, as chiropractors, we saw an awful lot of people who were injured in traffic crashes. Um, so I, I would say that I probably mostly specialized in, in crash related injuries. And it was at about that time um, that, and I'm sure just about everybody knows who Art Croft is. Um, Art Croft was teaching his modules, and I started to go uh, to his modules, and we became friends and started doing uh, research together. And so, um, uh, Art certainly is a, inspires you to 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 want to do research as well. Um, so all of that sort of came together at the same time. Wow. Um, so now, even before you met Art, what what was it that uh, got your interest peaked with crash related injuries? Well, it's such a contentious thing um, for uh, for the chiropractic practice because it's it's you know something where there's always an interest by another party in um, uh, minimizing the effect of the of the injury. I mean, uh, you know, chiropractors see non catastrophic, typically spinal or extremity injuries resulting from crashes. A lot of those crashes are going to be lower speed, lower damage crashes. Well, th there's a whole um, area of insurance defense that's directed at um, disparaging the injuries, uh, disparaging the people who, who claim injuries from such crashes, and disparaging anybody who treats them, including chiropractors. Um, and so maybe it was a bit of a pushback and saying, well, you know, I, all this stuff they're saying, but I should do research on this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And so that was what, what I think maybe uh, directed the, the area that I did my, my dissertation research in. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I, th I think uh, you laid out the motivation really well uh, for that. And it's a similar story to my own where I was interested in sports and how chiropractic might be able to affect sports, uh, injuries and performance and things. So, yeah, I appreciate you going into that because it, it makes a ton of sense on why you do what you do now and and why you do the kinds of studies that you do. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you, you talked about um, my, uh, my travels, if you will, through academia and, you know, doing various degrees and such. And, it, you know, really it's also directed by what I see. Um, I, I remember seeing a, 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 a comic or cartoon, I should say, like a New Yorker cartoon when I was a kid. And it was a guy who was, uh, you know, painter, and he was painting on a canvas, and he had his thumb out. You know, the way painters put their thumb out to get perspective. <laughs> uh -huh. And then, then what he was painting was his thumb, and and he says, "I paint what I see." <laughs> and, <laughs> and I always was struck by it. You know, first I was delighted as a child to actually get a New Yorker cartoon, but but also um, I, um, I I think it really directs how I do my research. I I I see something that interests me by the, the work that I do, um, whether it was, you know, working as a chiropractor and seeing the kind of patients that go to chiropractors and the injuries that come to them, or, uh, you know, dealing with, um, you know, I spent five years researching genocide in Rwanda with a, a PhD student. 
um, you know, those, if it's interesting, I, I want to write about it. I want to describe what it is I'm seeing. Wow. That, that's totally awesome. I love that. I know you have an appointment here in the U S and, and also overseas. So where are you at these days? <laughs> and, and do you go back and forth between all these places? Right. Well, mostly I'm, I'm in a, about a closet sized room in my house, um, which has a, a zoom, uh, <laughs> capability. So where, um, I can, I can set it up and get away from everybody because pretty much everything happens, um, uh, over zoom these days. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's very, the, the, the teaching that I do, um, is all at the post postgraduate level, postdoctoral level. And so it's pretty easy to do that sort of um, supervision of research or teaching or lectures by Zoom. Um, so so since the pandemic, um, the the need for travel um, has, has sort of gone away. I mean, it used to be, you know, if you got invited to a lecture overseas, uh, you had to get in a plane and fly over and then give the talk. And now it's pretty much easy to just throw somebody's image up on a screen. Um, and they can be wherever they, they need to be. And so um, I spend most of my time in Oregon, um, particularly the last year. Uh, I pretty much spend all my time in Oregon, which is where I live. Okay. Okay, great. And so you mentioned about teaching as well. What you teach at the postgraduate level or, or graduate uh, level, I guess, for the universities. So do you teach epidemiology and forensic medicine then? Well, it, basic epidemiology, there's so many people who can do that way better than I can. Um, I, I, I teach um, how epidemiologic methods are used in forensic medicine or in a forensic setting. So, uh, uh, and also how, how it's, it's misused, um, which I think we're going to get into a little bit um, because of some of the, the papers that you've uh, pulled out to talk about. Um, but um, uh, I run a PhD program in Maastricht. Uh, Maastricht is in the Netherlands. It's in the southwestern uh, part of the country, um, and it's it's just the most charming city you've ever seen. It's absolutely wonderful. Everything's, you know, the the uh, uh, the uh, what do you call it? The cobblestone streets and you know closed off the traffic. It's just absolutely charming. And the university is quite a good school and allows a lot of flexibility. So um, so I put together working with my comrade Maurice Ziegers, who is the chair of the department there in the at the medical school we put together a, a phd program in forensic medicine um which um has a component where you actually train in forensic medicine um we do that through a, a, a uk academy um so you learn all about the you know, death investigation autopsies and that sort of thing and that's all just a series of lectures and then some tests and performance um based assessments and then um there's a, a research requirement. The research requirement is you have to put together uh, and publish in good quality journals, five good quality research papers that are of different methods. So you demonstrate your knowledge of the methods. So my students are largely docs of some kind. I do currently have two chiropractic PhD students. Um, and then I've, I've had um, MD, like forensic pathology students, uh, and then I have some just straight science students. They're going from a master's in epidemiology into a PhD. Um, and uh, it's, it's well, it's, the, the program is wonderful on a variety of, of ways. It's, it's really based on research rather than taking a bunch of courses and uh, doing a bunch of tests. It's, it's how do you perform in the world of research and publication? Um, but it also doesn't cost the students anything which is kind of amazing. Um, so I can have international students um, and they don't, you know, you don't have people going into debt to be able to do uh, a research-based degree. And I, I really love that aspect of the program. Yeah, that's really, really fantastic. I love the, the uh, focus on doing the research, particularly different kinds of research. I think that makes for a well-rounded uh, researcher for sure. And uh, it sounds like a really cool program. You also mentioned that you're overseeing a couple of chiropractors, PhDs right now. And I know that uh, we're going to be talking with one of them uh, coming, or I'll be having an interview with him uh, coming up. So I look forward to that as well. It'll be a great uh, addition to, to our interview today. Now, you've 
published uh, a lot, obviously, in the space of whiplash injuries and fred- forensic medicine. And uh, I've certainly followed your work over the years and uh, I've reached out to you a couple times. I don't know if you remember me, but uh, asked specifically about some of the uh, soft tissue injuries and things. And, and we'll definitely get into that. I know that's a, a topic that you like to talk about. So we'll, we'll definitely do that. And maybe the best way... Um, to get into it is just to talk about some of these studies, because I think the studies themselves really bring up these important points for uh, not only chiropractors, but I think other healthcare practitioners. I think it's pretty um, inclusive of everybody that would come in contact with somebody who who is injured. So let's just dive in. Um, And the first paper is called Estimating the Number of Traffic Crash-Related Cervical Spine Injuries in the United States, an Analysis and Comparison of National Crash and Hospital Data. Uh, And this just came out in in 2020. And I'll put the uh, actual papers in the show notes on on the uh, podcast website. So anybody who wants to look at these certainly can. So Michael, I wonder if you could uh, tell us briefly about this paper and its significance. Right. Well, I tried to come up with the most boring title I could possibly come up with for a paper. <laughs> that was the one that won. Um, yeah, it, it, it doesn't sound like it's much of anything, but it, you know, as as uh, I said, I you know, I like the guy who paints what he sees. I really write about what I see as an issue or or a problem, and um, what's what's become a, a kind of a significant problem is that there have been a number of publications that have come out that have used the National Crash Injury Database, which is called the National Automotive Sampling System, Crashworthiness Data Sample, um, NAS CDS, um, which is a very powerful database. It's about 6,000 crashes per year that are fully investigated. They're reconstructed for the severity of the crash. And um, they 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 talk about the, the injuries and you know, all the medical information and and uh, talk about the biomechanics of how the injuries occur. It's a very, very uh, powerful database for drawing a lot of inferences. But a number of companies that only essentially work for insurance companies to testify that injuries just simply don't happen in traffic crashes, the kind that chiropractors see every day, um, have, have used this database to talk about the risk of um, disc injuries, neck and low back disc injuries. And so they've used the fact that this database um, that shows virtually no neck or back disc injuries that occur in relatively low speed crashes and very few that occur in hardly uh, almost any crashes um, and um, have used that to say people don't, don't get disc injuries in crashes. So if you've got someone who says that they're treating somebody for a disc injury, and it's not a big crash, it simply didn't happen. That was the problem that I saw that I wanted to address. And one of the things that I knew about this database, first of all, was that they only follow injuries for the first couple of days. All they look at is the first very acute injuries that may be reported most typically at an emergency department, occasionally at a doctor, and every once in a while just by the person's own reporting. Almost everything is out of the emergency department. Well. If you think about your experience, as a chiropractor was my experience, um, how many patients get in a car crash and have a disc injury and are diagnosed the day of the crash with a disc injury? Uh, just about none. Right. It just simply doesn't happen. Why is that? Well, because we typically diagnose a disc injury with an MRI. We don't see MRIs done very often in an emergency room. I mean, you do CT scans to see if you have a cult fracture or, or uh, if something else is going on with the bones. But, um, you know, MRIs just simply aren't typically done for the first month to two months or three months even, um, even with people who have radicular complaints, symptoms right away. So and immediately I knew there was something wrong with the way the, the, uh, the data were being collected and characterized. I mean, if you have a database that doesn't look for a particular injury and then you point to that database and, see, and say, see, that injury never happens then there's something wrong with your method. 
And so what I did in this study was I looked at all of the injuries reported in the, the crash injury database, and then I looked at hospital databases and emergency department databases, which are also, you know, they're epidemiologic databases. And I looked to see how they matched up because the hospital databases um, uh, uh, have E codes. I'm sure a lot of docs use E codes to talk about where did the injury occur. So there were there are multiple sources of information to tell us how often actually cervical spine injuries occur, disc injuries, what we call whiplash injuries. Uh, all of those injuries are 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 going to be seen in 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 all of the databases, but at different frequency. I wanted to see how good the NAS CDS was. And so that was the purpose of the study, was to compare side by side in these databases. Great. So what what were the major findings that you that you saw? Well, um, uh, basically, um, this this crash injury database, which is very good for estimating the frequency of uh, oh, uh, aortic transections in traffic crashes, or uh, uh, you know, not bad at under at, at estimating. Uh, spinal cord injuries, for example, injuries that we know are going to go to the hospital and we know they're going to be reported or or at the the um, uh, at at autopsy uh, that overall it underestimated all cervical injuries by eighty four percent of what's seen in just the emergency department. That doesn't include the people who never go to the emergency department and only see a chiropractic doc. Wow. Um, and what we found, was that if you if you look at disc injuries, the ones which these other companies were reporting um, was uh, never occurred in this database. <laughs> well, it, it's it's shocking because the NAS this this database under actually undercounts these um, injuries by a factor of about a hundred to one. In other words, they only get one out of a hundred injuries that are in the emergency department. But but if you're talking about low speed crashes because the database is only addressing crashes where there's been a tow away of one of the vehicles, that's even worse. And uh, that the, the, uh, the database probably samples less than one in 100,000 crashes uh, in which there is a, an injury occurring under 10 miles per hour. Wow. And so when you put all that together, the the studies that have been published saying people don't get disc injuries and in, in traffic crashes low back neck um they're just junk science i mean they were intentionally designed to not report injuries that are being seen um in chiropractic offices medical offices neurosurgery offices on a daily basis huh yeah i mean i'm still in practice part-time practice and i can you know, I'm thinking back to the the most recent cases that I've seen, and the, it's one of two situations. Typically, they maybe they go to the ER, they get the X-rays, nothing's broken, you're good to go. You know, uh, the, you might be with the pain for a little while. Follow up with your family doc uh, after a period of time, if you know if you're still having symptoms, or they come into the chiropractor maybe three or four days after the injury, you know, so they're definitely not coming in, uh, on the first day or two, usually, at least that's my experience, but, uh, coming in after, and that, that would be totally missed. It seems by, uh, this NASS CDS system that you talked about. So yeah, it's, uh, my experience follows exactly with what you're talking about here. That's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. It's fantastic that you reported on it. We'll say that. <laughs> Not fantastic that these other systems uh, really aren't even designed to catch that. Yeah, one of the things that we found that I thought was really interesting was that um, only one in 17 disc injuries from any severity of crash is actually diagnosed in the emergency department. Huh. So 16 out of 17 of those injuries are diagnosed later. And so that's another another reason to um, not use this database for, for these injuries. But, you know, overall, we found out that we, we were able to quantify approximately how many injuries that would be considered, quote, whiplash injuries, which is about 1.2 million per year uh, in the United States, and that probably 30 to 40,000 at least uh, disc injuries just in the, the cervical spine 
uh, every year result from these crashes. Wow. Well, that yeah, that that was my next question. Like, just how serious of a public health problem is it? But you answered that. So it was, you know, just over a million. Uh, that's that's incredible. Uh, and yeah. based upon what we're seeing, you know, with these databases currently, you know, prior to your reporting of uh, the results matching up with the emergency database, it was, I mean, piddly amount. <laughs> Right. right. So <laughs> chiropractors, I think chiropractors need to be aware of the fact that when the patient comes in and says, I was in a traffic crash and my neck hurts, um, you're dealing with something that is actually has a relatively big impact on public health. Okay. Yeah. That, that's it's important. Yeah. It's super important, it seems. So that's great. Um, I'm also curious um, about your thoughts then when it might be important for an individual to get examined after a collision? Um, when they hurt. <laughs> I mean, the hallmark of, the hallmark of, of uh, injury is that typically you know it when you get it. And so, uh, you know, there are lots of people who are in traffic crashes and not hurt. And, um, you know, there's this idea of getting checked out. You know, when they, uh, there was this, uh, what was called WAD, Whiplash Associated Disorder, um, uh, set of criteria where, which was developed by an you know, insurance company finance organization. And they, they included WAD zero, which is no symptoms, no findings at all, just scared that you're going to be permanently injured. Oh, give me a break. Who, <laughs> you know, if you're in a car crash, and you don't get hurt. You get out and say, no, I was fine. You don't worry about the fact that you're going to be crippled someday because you had no injury. You know, people know it when they're hurt, and common sense is kind of important here. And yeah. so when, if somebody has symptoms, get checked out. But if you don't have symptoms, um, you know, what's the harm in waiting to see if you're going to have symptoms? It's not like, the, you know, waiting a few days after a traffic crash is, is uh, to see if you're going to have problems is, is going to create some sort of permanent problem. Right, so right. I think and it's a common sense driven issue. Okay. Yeah. And so, I mean, most people like any injury, you're probably going to feel it within, you know, 72 hours or thereabouts, I imagine. Yes. So yeah, yes. very good. Yes. Very I, good. I talk a lot about temporality, temporal proximity as a, as a, a metric of causality of causation. Basically the quicker symptoms come on, um, the less likely anything else could account for the symptoms other than the event. So you basically squeeze out other, other, uh, explanations for an injury um but and i get asked um at, when i testify sometimes um well how long could it go i mean could it be two weeks three weeks four weeks um you know three months uh, if a patient comes to you and says i was in a car crash i had no symptoms at all for three months i don't think anybody is going to say yeah, I think that the problem that you woke up with this morning, three months later, is all attributable to the crash. Right. So you have to use common sense. <laughs> right. and, and I would say, you're, you know, with your 72 hours, you're probably covering 90 plus percent of, of the injuries. That's not to say that there aren't distracting injuries. You know, you can break an ankle and be on your back for the first week after a crash and not know that you have a back injury until you get up and move around a lot. Yeah. Or an ankle. So those are... You know that that's different, but someone is completely fine. That's how many how many days? In, I would I would challenge anybody to tell me what is your experience. Have you ever seen anybody who was like five days, seven days, ten days with no symptoms at all? Right, and then the symptoms started. That's just very very rare. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm glad you went through that, and and the fact that you're asked that <laughs> as an expert witness, I think that's pretty telling, actually. And I'm glad you went through that discussion. It, I think, clinically, it just makes a lot of sense as you're saying. So, appreciate that. Let's get into uh, another paper, and this one I found totally amazing. I think this is going to open up a lot of questions. At least it did for me. And this was. Uh, uh, diagnostic accuracy of video fluoroscopy for symptomatic cervical spine injury following whiplash trauma. So if, if you could tell us about this paper, totally fascinating. And then, uh, and then I'll barrage you with a bunch of questions after. <laughs> okay. Why does it, why do all my 
paper 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 titles sound so boring. I guess. <laughs> but, but actually, this is this is again another another uh, you know I paint what I see kind of case, which is um, is is there a test that allows us to discriminate between people who have been injured in a crash and people who haven't been injured in a crash? And and why do I you know why is that important? Because you know, if if you uh, take care of patients who have been in traffic crashes and you and uh, you do a flexion extension study, you say, well, they had instability, um, you know, three or four millimeters anterior instability and flexion. Um, there's the the insurance companies have no problem finding a, a line of radiologists a hundred deep who will get up and say that's totally normal, that's within normal limits. <laughs> Huh. And so the, the question the question that that I was interested in is, well, a is that really true? I mean, how how good are those data uh, that that indicate first of all that that instability is abnormal, and and uh, is there anything that shows that it is it's you know how common it is in uh, uninjured people, and and um, um, you know how good is is video fluoroscopy or DMX, uh, uh, another term for it. Uh, for diagnosing the condition. And so what I was really looking for was, is there a test that can identify injured people and do it to a high degree of reliability? And so over a 10-year period, we collected, uh, I think it was 77 normals, people with not a history of injury, who underwent um, a video fluoroscopy or fluoroscopic examination of the neck and we looked at I don't know, like 30, 40 parameters um, of instability um, that were read by two different uh, radiologists. Uh, one, I think we had an MD radiologist in there, but they're mostly chiropractic radiologists or or clinical docs who read these films, um, which is you know not me. I don't. I left that up to my colleagues who who look at the DMX films. And then uh, we assembled a hundred and what was a hundred and twelve. Let's see. 119 people who had been injured and had had the exact same uh, examination. And then we tried to figure out, is there some sort of threshold for instability that helps you discriminate injured from uninjured? How good is this test uh, for discriminating injured from uninjured? Um, because if, if the people who do these studies are correct, which is this is a very sensitive way to find out if someone's been hurt, and that it not only does it identify that they are hurt, but it also tells you what is causing their injury. What what is their the nature of their injury, which is instability. At least that's part of their injury. If that's if that's what you're finding. So there is a lot of um, importance to answering this question of how good this study is. And what we found is that the the test is actually very very good at identifying people who are hurt and discriminating between them and people who aren't hurt. And um, we use something called positive predictive value, which um, is the, the, the it's, it's a value that tells you when this test is positive, how often is the person injured versus being uninjured. So if your positive predictive value is 0.7 or 70%, that means 70% of the time when you have a positive test, the person's really hurt, and 30% of the time they're not hurt. Um, well, we found that um, if we had two or more abnormal findings, that um, the positive predictive value of that test was 88%. That means you can be 88% certain this person is injured, their injury came from a traumatic event, the traffic crash, that you're examining them for, and that this is probably at least a partial source of their symptoms. This is what's wrong with them, at least partially. Um, and if you uh, went up to uh, four or more abnormal findings, that it was 100%. If you had uh, lateral, um, uh, asymmetric lateral movement of the atlas on the axis and abnormal um, a dense symmetry to atlas uh, symmetry on the same view, that was also 100% sensitive for trauma, uh, traumatic injury. 
So it turns out it's actually a very powerful study um, and um, one that is uh, probably should be done more, more frequently to uh, identify where the injury is in people with chronic symptoms after traffic crashes. Yeah, thanks for thanks for going through all that. I I remember <clears throat> as I was graduating from chiropractic college, uh, the idea of soft tissue injuries and documentation of them. Uh, it was a it was a tricky thing because at the time the clinical logic was ah people are going to be healed up in you know four to six weeks. We're only going to you know insurance companies are only going to pay for this amount of care, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the, the idea of trying to locate or find the soft tissue injury on things like x-rays or even MRIs, honestly, uh, that's, that's tough. And so, you know, a study like this comes along and wow, I mean, it's pretty powerful stuff, right? And so I think it's one way to, to try to document these injuries and what a cool way to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. And, um, you know, I was exposed to um, a lot of colleagues in, in chiropractic who were uh, involved with DMX, which is where I found a lot of my, where I found all my source material. Um, but plain x-ray um, flexion extension views, same rules apply. This is stuff you can do in your office. This is, I think VF gives you, or DMX gives you a greater range of, of, um, findings of instability that you can locate uh, or uh, asynchronous movement and that sort of thing um, that you just can't really see on uh, plain x-ray. But um, uh, what I can, um, uh, you know, definitely say is that if you just plain x-ray flexion extension, you have abnormalities, two or more, that was caused by um, caused by a crash, if that's in the history. Huh. Wow. Okay. So people don't have to run out and, and get one of these, uh, video fluoroscopy units uh, necessarily. They can, they can use the tools they already have. Just look at them in a different way, perhaps. Precisely. Precisely. Um, I, I think there's, there's more than one way to, uh, uh, to use this, this, uh, this information, this knowledge. Got it. Somebody wrote what I thought was kind of a nutty letter to the editor, um, a chiropractor, um, where they were complaining that we were using the rule of twos to do our study. And they said, well, you, you, that's some, somebody just made that up and you shouldn't have used that. Um, our study actually, um, we, we validated a, a system of assessing, um, uh, a, assessing diagnostic sensitivity that included the rule of twos, but also went to, you know, zero to four, zero to six um, millimeters of instability. Um, and, um, it turns out that in a lot of cases, the rule of twos actually is, um, absolutely adequate for identifying that two or more, um, finding for abnormality. But we also talk about the fact that it doesn't apply in all cases. I'm not sure that everybody has, who has commented about this, the study has actually read it completely. Sometimes people just look at an abstract and say, this makes me mad. And then they write a letter. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but yeah. it's a it's a very solid study, and um, quite frankly, it is the last word on this topic, and it is the largest validation diagnostic validation study of its kind that exists. Yeah, I love it. I love it because in in research, you know, bridging research and practice, one of the things that happens in research a lot is you, you're always trying to look for the appropriate variables that can explain things. And the fact that you have such high predictive values, positive predictive values, <laughs> I mean, it's converging on that this is, like you say, at least one of the causes. I mean, there could be others, I suppose, but I think with the four abnormal findings, you found a positive predictive value of one. Yeah, 100%. If you find four abnormal findings, that doesn't exist in the healthy population that we examine. And there's very high level of uh, statistical certainty with that. That's huge. Yeah. I mean, totally yes, amazing. Is. So well, I, it's, a, well, it's a, it's a truth test, you know, people, people who have uh, injuries and say, I, I'm in constant pain and it's been two years since the crash. 
and you do a, a flexion extension series or you do a, 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 a DMX or VF study and you find four positive findings according to what we talked about in the protocol, um, that, that's, a, that's a truth detector. You you gotta go. You gotta go to the court. You can go to the the, the attorney. You can go to the, the 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 claims adjuster and say this person is there's a hundred percent probability this person was injured in the crash and that the persisting problem they have is related to instability at least in part. Yeah. Wow. I I know no other study. Of course, this isn't my area, but <laughs> I'm sure uh, this has to be the only study of its kind. Uh, like this, a validation study? Yes, it yeah, is. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, you're just a wealth of knowledge, and I want to tap your knowledge a, a bit more and bridge this forensic background to to the to the doctors who are out there seeing patients, because I don't think they know any of this. And this paper that we're talking about just came out uh, this past year. So I want to I want to ask about. So I guess some more clinical related issues and, and perhaps you can use both your clinical and research mind to help us out. So what are, what are some of the important, uh, let's say historical factors uh, as a clinician or risk factors, as you will uh, to identify in, in the history of people with um, injuries resulting from motor vehicle collisions? Uh, it's so darn multifactorial, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's really, it, nothing is absolutely determinative. That, that's, that's number one. You okay. know, if you say um, having your neck turn at the time of a crash increases your risk, that doesn't mean you can't be hurt when your head is straight, for example. Um, it, uh, uh, you know, the, the looking at the severity of the crash is the least predictive. And in fact, there's very good uh, research that came out within the last year and a half or so that actually looked at um, prognosis associated with crash severity, uh -huh. how, how long you might have symptoms, and showed that there was absolutely no relationship at all. Wow. Um, there's so many other factors that go on to predict how long someone is going to have symptoms. Um, I think that that one of the factors that is such a, a right at um, uh, chiropractic doc's hands when they see these patients, one of the biggest factors has got to be evidence of central sensitization. When when a patient's peripheral pain thresholds, not I'm not talking about where they hurt, you know, in a neck or a back or a low back. I'm talking about the the you know the anterior tibial muscle um, or or uh, you know uh, areas where there shouldn't be hypersensitivity. If pain thresholds start to drop in those areas after a crash, and that should, and I think it should be monitored um, very closely for the first multiple weeks if patients are being seen, that is a negative harbinger uh, for recovery because it means that centrally in the brain of the spinal cord, um, there's there's a, a failure to um, to uh, process pain peripheral sources of pain properly and that can turn into a cycle of chronic pain that's that's something that i think is very very important to uh, examine to document and um to try to address aggressively early on excellent and what do you think about uh patient reported outcomes uh things like neck disability index oswestry disability index is there is there anything specific to whiplash type of injuries or should you just do what you would normally clinically do for, for each of those regions? Depends on what you normally do clinically for those regions. <laughs> um, if, <laughs> good, good one. <laughs> if you're trying to quantify um, the degree of disability or show improvement over time or justify long-term care, you know, two years out, you're still seeing a patient once every three weeks and, um, those can be really good tools to demonstrate efficacy of care or um, uh, persistence of uh, of symptoms. So neck NDI neck disability uh, index or uh, is it inventory index um, is um, a, a good way to to be able to demonstrate that you know if the, the patient goes more than three weeks uh, between treatments, um, they're they're 
NDI goes up. Um, whereas if I keep them at three weeks, it stays at a more manageable level. That's something a lot of people don't talk about, but it's great to be able to demonstrate efficacy of care. Um, and ef and efficacy of care isn't always to cure. Sometimes it's to palliate. Agreed. Yeah, totally. Totally. I know we're going to be talking about biomechanical factors uh, in the next paper. What about psychosocial factors? How, how do they... Uh... How do they How do you figure they factor in? Well, we have in epidemiology. Uh, I'm sure you know, uh, and a lot of people know this. There's you know this concept of reverse causation, you know, putting the cart before the horse kind of thing. And so, uh, uh, the uh, psychosocial factors is, I think, an excellent example of that. So you see somebody after a crash, and they 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 have chronic pain, but they also have elevated. Um, you know, psychological uh, risk factors for chronic pain. Well, okay, which one came first? I mean, having chronic, ha having pain after a crash, having to get your car fixed, <laughs> not be able to work and be in, you know, constant physical pain is a source of uh, psychological distress. And th the idea that, um, uh, if you find psychological distress or somebody's depressed, that that all of a sudden becomes an explanation for something that was actually explained in the get from the get go by the fact that they were injured in a crash and they had their uh, the, the person had their life disrupted. Um, you know, you got to use a little bit of common sense with that. Um, I would say that a, a such a significant amount of the literature that has discussed the psychosocial issues has come from the perspective of looking to exculpate the the crash as the, the cause of ongoing problems and say, you know, all they need to do is get to uh, some sort of work hardening program or, you know, or, or uh, you know, don't give them any treatment because then you're just reinforcing their fake beliefs and their injuries. Um, I'm not a fan um, of, of that kind of research because I think that it is um, dehumanizing and I think that it is harmful. And I think it serves the financial interests of only one of the parties that's involved, and that's the insurer. I, I'm glad you brought that up, and I'm glad you you went through that and, and gave that example. I, I think it's, uh, it's something that we see certainly in the research of other aspects, whether it be back pain, other musculoskeletal issues. And and I think you're right. It, it's, um, you know, there, there is certainly a, a camp of researchers, at least that uh, that I can think about, uh, that seem to want to promote that as uh, as a mechanism, let's say, not of injury, but uh, I don't know, maybe of injury. <laughs> it's a weird thing to think about, but uh, you know, having paper. yeah, yeah. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I no, I, I wrote a paper. You remind me that in fact I wrote a paper about I don't know, like 15 years ago called a, a, a fatal a fatal case of secondary gain. Um, and it was, it was about a man who injured himself on the job, uh, a relatively young man. He was in his twenties and, um, started to have long track signs, uh, indicating that he had a spinal cord injury. Hmm. Um, and he went to a series of different doctors. He went to a, um, this was actually concerning a, a, a medical malpractice case. I was involved with as an expert. Um, uh, there I go again, painting what I see, right? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> um, but uh, um, he he uh, got injured on the job, and he was sent by his work to the one of the Oc Med docs who was sort of captive to that company um, or that they had contracts with. Hmm. And so he says, yeah, I got a lot of pain, and, you know, my legs feel weak. And uh, the guy says, go back to work. <laughs> So then, so then he goes to a, a chiropractor, but but unfortunately, he picks one of these chains, you know, where they've got like ten docs who rotate in and out of it, and they uh -huh. have a bunch of different practices. Yep. And so he sees a different doc all the time, and there was a limited number of treatments that they could get under the workers' comp um, uh, guidelines. So they continued to treat him for the fifteen or twenty times that they could, and you know saying, oh, he's got all these problems, all these problems. And when they got to 20, they said, okay, he's released. Ah. And, and never actually identified why he kept complaining about, gee, I'm having a hard time picking my feet up. Um, and I've got this neck injury. What's going on? 
And then he went to a, a fellow who um, uh, he was sent to by the insurer, who was a defense medical examiner, an, another Ahmed guy who said he has nothing wrong with him. He's malingering. Mm. And ultimately ended up having a central cord syndrome. He got hooked on opiates and he died of an overdose. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, so, so I, I went through it and I talked about this idea of secondary gain. You know, that's what you say when the patient comes in and, you know, they're, they're, they're making complaints, but they're not real complaints. They're just for the money. That's a, a real popular um, uh, sort of story that comes from the defense. Oh, it's secondary gain uh, because they shouldn't have these complaints. And I talked about the fact that there are secondary gain factors for the the clinicians too. There was secondary gain for the guy who was working for the company because he wants to keep his job. So he has to send people back to work. Secondary gain for the chiropractors who treated as much as they could without first primary concern for this man's you know, benefit for, for his health. There was the, the, the guy who worked for the insurance company who all he wanted to do was get more get more exams so he could keep doing his exams and you can't give him bad news. So he said, yeah, there's nothing wrong with him. And so the concept that secondary gain is something that is isolated to the patient because they might get um, some sort of reparations for something that's been taken away from them. They're legitimately injured. Um, why can't that also be in the, the, uh, the other people who are involved in the case? Um, and so that was, it's an important concept because because if there's motivation to um, to to say that somebody's re you know not really injured or maybe they're not really injured, if there's motivation, particularly if there's financial motivation to do that, you're going to find people who are going to do that, and it's not going to have much to do with what is best for the patient. Hmm. I'm sad to hear about that case. Uh, I I bet that happens. Uh, well. I don't know how often that happens, but hopefully not too often. It's pretty much a weekly occurrence in 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 the, the forensic practice. Wow. Yeah, I mean, not exactly that, but it's not it's not that unusual. Um, it's yeah, it's it's uh, well, I mean, if if you stick your hand up and say, "All right, I'll see the worst of the worst," you are going to be a collection point for them, and so it's not surprising that I see a lot of them. But um, certainly, it's 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 not. It's not an unheard of sort of uh, sort of complication. Sure. Okay. Um, now, what about uh, treatment? Uh, I know this could open up a can of worms. So, <laughs> um, what what do you see as uh, you know? The, I'm sure you're pretty well versed in all the treatment guidelines as well. Um, and you know, this is you know five ten years ago. I'm kind of thinking back about guidelines and the. Uh, Quebec Task Force, and then uh, the neck pain uh, decade, bone and joint decade, put out uh, some some guidelines for acute neck pain, which included a whiplash and and mobilization and manipulation was included and uh, that sort of thing. What what do you see as uh, what what the research is is supporting for for treatment these days? You're you're actually kind of getting out of my my wheelhouse to some degree there. I mean I. I, I don't. I don't actually deal with things like guidelines. Um, guidelines. Um, well, I mean, if you see guidelines that are uh, sponsored by uh, insurers, or that there's a, uh, you see researchers who have done work for insurers, like the Bone and Deck, uh, Bone and Joint Decade uh, Cervical Spine had a, a lot of folks who are out of the Quebec Task Force, and the Quebec Task Force came from that was an insurance uh, sponsored. A study the, the whiplash associated disorders was all straight out of uh, you know paid for by the the Quebec insurer um, and and you know they had they had uh, an agenda for sure um, uh, if you see uh, guidelines from those folks they tend to be more conservative and if you see the guidelines from people who aren't working for the insurers they're less conservative but you know what I I tell docs is that um, they gave you a license for a reason. And, and that means that, that you use your clinical judgment to give the best care for the person. And if you make a decision that this patient needs continued care beyond guidelines and you can justify it, then you should, you should definitely be 
you know, putting your foot down saying, this is what this person needs, because now you're advocating for your patient. You're not advocating for yourself. And um, I was like, um, I had a internal medicine textbook that I never was able to find again. But in the, in the frontest piece of it, um, it said, if it works, keep doing it. If it doesn't work, stop doing it. <laughs> yeah. And, and I've always liked that idea. I mean, demonstrate that what you're doing is continuing to work and then keep doing it. And if it doesn't work, stop doing it. That's it's it's a great guideline. Yeah. And, and you know, I've, it, I've never I've never been a fan of using research and saying, well, until you come with a randomized controlled trial, don't even talk to me about using that stuff, because the people who say that, you know, for medicine, for example, are also doing, um, you know, uh, uh, knee surgeries where there's no demonstration of long term benefit or <laughs> giving medicines that. <laughs> You know, for which there's, you know, there's all sorts of complications and risk benefit is, you know, all all over the map. Um, you know, I, there's a lot of pot calling the kettle black when it comes to saying research must show X, Y, Z. And chiropractors get um, feedback from their patients about what they're doing and whether it helps. And they get it real time. And, yeah. and conscientious docs give good care. I'm so glad you talked about that. I mean, evident, and that gets right back to uh, evidence-based practice. The whole core of it is that you use research, whatever is out there. And as you said, you're not going to have a randomized clinical trial, and if for everything that is, and if you wait till one comes around, you're never you're not going to see any patients, <laughs> right? right? No. And and you're not going to help those patients. I mean, That's if you, right. If you have something. If, if, if you became a chiropractor or a PM&R doc or a dentist or any other healthcare provider, because you think that what you offer has value, it, it's your obligation to try to, to, to use it in the way that you think it, it offers the best value. That's also not completely nutty, too. I mean, I mean yeah. you, within, within, <laughs> within reason, um, but, but um, you know, withholding care because an insurer says, yeah, well, this is all we're going to give you. Um, you know, that that's, I think that that borders on, on being unethical. You say, well, I just can't see anymore um, because the insurance company won't pay. I mean, I, well, yeah, I mean, I get that. It's, it's, it's a financial issue, but they're also, the, the patient's benefits always got to be balanced there. Great, great discussion. Um, and I'm really looking forward to this next paper. And this next paper is called is acceleration a valid proxy for injury risk in minimal damage traffic crashes? And this, I think, gets us into one of the things we've been talking about, you know, soft tissue injuries, minimal damage. Uh, I'm so excited to hear you talk about this. So how about you walk us through this paper and, and just the the concept in general? Yeah, yeah. So this, this goes way back uh, into... You know my my early to mid '90s research that I was doing for my uh, my PhD work, um, and and in to some degree in response to how insurers treat these cases, um, which is to say we're going to try to do everything we can to match vehicle damage to uh, some sort of assumption of injury risk, so that juries and judges are going to look at pictures of bumpers and say, you know, it's just not very much. I don't see why this person still hurts or why they got, how they got a disc injury. Um, so again, the guy who paints what he sees, um, this was definitely my thumb, if anything was my thumb, because I see a lot of this. And it's the defense of traffic injury cases. And I see, I have a lot of these in my forensic practice. Um, when there is significant injury, you know, somebody gets in a, a crash, there isn't a huge amount of damage, but they end up with, you know, multiple level uh, disc surgery. So the cases are, are, have a lot of damages associated with them. And they bring the, they, they haul out the same cast of characters, you know, guys who claim some sort of biomechanics background who say, well, this crash, uh, I reconstructed it. And here's all my technical Frabba Jabba terms and Delta V and and uh, you know uh, EES and and uh, um, you know Newtons and you know, all this all this technical <laughs> language, which is you know, be, bedazzles the uh, the uh, layperson, 
And then, and then they say, well, you know, the forces are really less in this crash than they are if you sneeze or just sit down in a chair. In fact, just the, just the forces uh, every day of gravity, as I'm sitting here right now, the forces are as much as they would be in this crash. And you've got someone who went to the emergency room and they ended up with a disc herniation or had to have surgery or they've got, you know, two years of chronic pain. And they've got some nitwit who's showing up and saying, oh, well, you know, it's all the same as everyday activities. And you would think that this would be such an obvious one. You would say, okay, well, there's 1.2 million people who get what are called whiplash injuries every year. And at least three or 400,000 of those occur in crashes with less than $500 damage. So if that's true, how can that be the same as activities of daily living? Well, it's not. Right. So we, d- we did an analysis, of, a, a worldwide literature analysis of every crash test study that was ever published to look at the biomechanics of the injuries and the forces of, uh, sorry, not the injuries of the crashes, uh, and the forces in you know, low speed crashes that volunteers have vol- volunteered for. Um, w- we looked at um, uh, all of the activity of daily living studies and and tried to summarize what they talked about and what kind of forces were involved with with those studies. And then we actually looked at real world crash injury data where crashes were reconstructed using event data recorders, you know, the black box from the airbag uh, in the vehicle um, to actually know what the severity of the crash was. And then that was matched to the the, uh, injuries that were diagnosed and observed medically in the uh, in the, the the people who had been in the crashes, and we looked at whether there was any injury. This was only looking at the neck injury that persisted for more than six months, chronic injury, and then disc injury. What's called a, a what, well, what they call wad wad two, which I don't use the wad grading, but it's it's with radiculopathy, so it's a presumptive disc injury. And then we compared them all, and what we found was essentially the injury risk. Of a of a, a minimal damage rear impact crash is at least two thousand and probably more like twenty thousand or more times greater than it is for any activity of daily living. That that the entire concept behind it is just to um, mislead fact finders, juries, and judges into believing maybe this crash just couldn't have caused these injuries because the forces are just so low and there's so much like everyday activities that people just don't get hurt in. But the fact is, it's it's all just uh, basically the hand is quicker than the eye. And you use a bunch of junk science terminology and um, a bunch of pseudoscientific methods to come out the other end and say, yeah, it's the same as activities of daily living. That is fascinating. So if if it's not the the G's or the you know the biomechanics the uh, acceleration what what is it about these minimal damage impacts that you think is is leading to these actual injuries that people have well i mean it's it's so well studied i mean even a 3 mile an hour rear impact collision moves your to- moves your torso forward at three miles an hour, but your head stays in the same place for a fraction of a second. Mm. And so your lower spine is accelerating while your head, the inertia of your head is keeping it still. So mm. you're basically hyperextending your mid and lower cervical spine. And that's where this, this cla- a lot of people know about this idea of a, an S-shaped curve that develops in the neck yep. for a very short yep. period of time um, that, that puts very significant stresses onto the disc, the facets, um, and raise the potential for injury. It's completely an external load. Um, and as you get into, you know, a, a three mile an hour Delta V rear impact crashes, you know, speed change is not, doesn't sound that big of a deal. And a lot of people are not going to be hurt. But if you go to six miles per hour, it's not double the energy or force, it's quadruple the force. And so a very, a relatively small change in crash severity, uh, you know, one mile an hour little bump, you know, is one sixteenth the force of a four mile an hour rear impact crash. So um, you rapidly ramp up um, the acceleration forces in a curvilinear way, even if you the damage looks the same. Because 
a one mile an hour rear impact crash looks exactly like a five mile an hour rear impact crash, looks exactly like a seven or even eight mile an hour rear impact crash. If you're talking about vehicle damage in a bumper to bumper to crash, bumpers are made to withstand such crashes without showing damage or, or very minimal damage. And so, right. so if they all look the same and then you you classify everything like a one mile mile an hour crash, that's the real problem. The real issue here is that insurers and and the people who work for them, the, the biomechanical experts, defense experts, are pretending like we don't know how often people get hurt in crashes. But the fact is we do. And the purpose of this paper was to very clearly state, here's the injury risk of various levels of crashes. And so on one of the pages in the paper, you'll see the analysis of the real world crash data to show at a you know, a, a six, seven, eight kilometer per hour rear impact delta V. Sorry, I had to do it in kilometers. <laughs> just, mul just multiply it times 0.62 and you'll get miles per hour. Um, but you'll see in the chart, this is the chance this person would be hurt. You know, there's a, the, at a, a six uh, plus mile per hour delta V or so, which is still in the range of no damage or, or very little damage, um, there's about a one in 28 risk of a disc injury. Hmm. Uh, 27 out of 28 people aren't going to get a cervical disc injury, but that it's also one in 28 who are. And how do you find out whether this person was a one in 28? You take a doggone history from them. Yep. You, you don't you don't roll a die a dice um, and and get a five and then say, well, there was only a one in six chance it was going to be a five. Therefore, it's not a five. You know, observation is key here. Yeah, And if someone's in a crash, has a 1 in 28 risk of causing a disc injury, and after the crash, they have a disc injury that they didn't have before, then the crash, they're the 1 in 28, was going to get the disc injury and did get it. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I like that logic. And and I'm also curious, you mentioned the the biomechanics of the cervical spine, the, the S-shaped curve that happens so quickly. I'm curious, when... When you're doing your forensic work and and you're at a trial or you're testifying, what uh, I mean, what could the other uh, forensic person like? Do they just disregard that that happened? <laughs> I mean, I don't get it. Uh, it they it seems it's like it's weird. Daily living. Yeah, they say it's activities of daily living. Huh. It's just like it's just like you know. Look, the forces. I've got a chart over here, and the forces are the same. Um, I always emphasize the sort of the clinical causation perspective. Um, you talk uh, in the the introduction, you talked about the Etherton case, which is the three-step causation approach, um, which is actually a really important thing for for chiropractic docs to know about um, because it, 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 it gives a systematic approach to assessing injury cause, which starts out with looking at the crash and saying, you know, is the crash enough to cause an injury? And this paper that you have here certainly gives you that information and then looks at temporal factors. What's, what's the timing of the onset of the symptoms? And lastly says, if the crash doesn't happen, what's the chance that you're going to get all the problems anyway? What's the chance they're going to be at the emergency department or, or still, you know, treating, uh, uh, seeing, getting chiropractic care a year later, if they didn't have those problems before, if they're 45 year old person made it to 45 without any problems, and then they get in this crash. And from the day, that day forward, they have nothing but problems. What would you have expected had they been at home sitting on their sofa watching TV at the time of the crash and not in the crash? If that's the first question that you're asking, the but for question, then then that is the appropriate approach in your mind to how you assess the causation. Because it doesn't matter what all of the numbers are on the crash, uh, uh, you know, all of the, the crash reconstruction and the G's and all that stuff. You know, that's all fine. And as a technical expert, I can certainly talk about that, and I do. But I always start out by saying what I think every doc should start out by saying, which is, look, I, I look, the very first thing I did was look at this person's history and say, would we expect them to have had all these problems if they hadn't been in the crash? If the answer is no. Then we proceed with the analysis. But that's a pretty strong historical finding right there, is that this person probably would have had a 46th and 47th and 48th year that looked like 43 and 44 before the crash. Right. Right. Yeah. That's, uh, that's awesome. Uh, and I'm glad you went through that. And so, uh, the three points that you're talking about, 
uh, from the Etherton case, uh, you mentioned that uh, these are, I just want to make sure I have this correct and, and other chiropractors and docs out there can look at it. Um, is Are those three points in, in this acceleration paper or should they look somewhere else? Uh, I can put a link to it no. as well. Right, right. They're not in the paper. They're actually, the three points are from, um, or three steps are from a paper I published in 2009, okay. which was on how to evaluate causation and traffic crash related disc injuries very much very much uh you know painting what i'm saying again um but um th th that that is the source of those three steps and actually uh was the cited uh source of the three steps in this um district court of appeals u.s district court of appeals case which one of the panel members was neil gorsuch so this was a, a very high level, you know, second only to the Supreme Court wow. uh, determination that this is a generally accepted way to do this causal analysis. And it was written for clinician. Um, I'm happy to send you the paper if you want to make it available. Oh, that would that would be terrific. Yeah, I, I definitely uh, provide a, a link and, and just uh, a link to uh, the, the abstract, if nothing else, would be fantastic. So people know where to get it. That would be great. I can send you the whole paper. Not a problem. Awesome. Awesome. Appreciate that. So, Michael, what are your future studies going to be looking at? Oh, boy. Um, well, I'm heavily involved with um, uh, in custody and uh, police restraint related deaths and have published something last summer um, that is highly relevant to to the role of um, of, of restraint, uh, particularly prone restraint um in some of these deaths that occur in custody and in fact i'm i'm one of the experts in the george floyd prosecution um and uh provide have already provided an analysis for that i don't i don't know if i'll be testifying or not because it depends on how the the trial goes but um uh it, it, this is an area of great interest and so um i have a couple of phd students who are doing work in that area um we're uh looking um, one of my areas of interest and has been for quite a while is uh, the use of um, stem cell therapy, autologous stem cell therapy uh, from like bone marrow concentrate uh, to um, uh, improve joint function, to grow back basically cartilage uh, in joints that's been damaged. So like hips and knees and shoulders. And in fact, I've published about 20, 20 25 papers with my colleagues on that topic. And we have the largest uh, group of patients that have been followed in the world. On that, so that's also really important because it'd be great to instead of going to the orthopedist and being told come back when you need knee replacement, um, actually getting your own cells injected into your knee, and then um, maybe you 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 can put off knee replacement, or maybe you never have to have knee replacement because you're actually using the well, this may sound familiar to chiropractors the own uh, the healing power of your own body, uh, yeah, <laughs> to yeah, to heal and and so. Um, that's also a, an area of, of interest as well. Fascinating. Well, uh, how do you find the time to do all this stuff? You know, you, I'll tell you if, if you, if you showed me what I do now, 25 years ago, I would have said, there's no way I could do all that, but it actually feels very natural because it's all kind of similar in a lot of ways and you know, similar concepts are underlying it. Um, and, I work with really remarkable people. There's a staff of eight scientists who work with me in the, the forensic practice and a, a bunch of other folks who I work with. And I have really wonderful people that um, I get to knock around ideas with, um, including at the, the uh, you know, at the medical schools where, where uh, there are other faculty that I work with. So, um, and, and then I get, you know, I get really inspired. I mean, I, you know, talking to you is it, it's inspirational that you're trying to communicate this sort of information out there because if someone's going to listen to this and say, you know what, I think I want to maybe you know, write something up. I, I want to, I want to get involved in, in, in talking about my experiences because really every chiropractic doc is a epidemiologist of sorts. I mean, you, you your, your, your population that you study is your, your own patient population. You, you know what the efficacy is of the, the care that you give. Um, and there's a lot of information that is uh, um, 
that, that is, it, it's, it's a gold mine of information, basically, the, the information that you glean from your patients. Hmm. Well, I think that uh, goes well with my next and, and last question, which is uh, that, you know, one of the missions of this podcast, as you mentioned, is just to get information out there uh, to practitioners and, and students, anybody really interested in research, particularly hope and hopefully chiropractic research, but any research in, in general. So I'm wondering, uh, could you offer any advice to aspiring chiropractors or students who may wish to become scientists in the future? Yes. Um, doing research is like riding a bike, I think, um, in that it looks, you know, kind of difficult. I mean, if you remember going back to the time when you learned to ride a bike as a child, it was like a kind of a tough thing until you sort of got the idea of, of how you do it. And doing research requires enough knowledge to get that feeling. You don't have to do a PhD or even a master's to be able to do research. And, and like I said, I mean, everybody's got material. They have interesting cases they can write up as case studies. Um, but there are, um, there are uh, uh, many, many papers that are written by clinicians who just decide to uh, describe the things that they see in their practice. But you can't just start writing it up because, because I, I, I promise you, whatever you write up will be terrible because that's what I found. When I started <laughs> writing, I was, it was terrible. And so you got to get a little bit of experience under your belt. And the, the, the way to do that, there's a couple of ways to do that. I mean, you can read and read and read and read case uh, series or case studies, case series um, and research you can take a couple of epidemiology courses and research design courses and writing courses. Those can be done online. Um, I highly recommend that so that you understand the kind of the nature of what you're trying to do. Um, research is, like I say, it's, it's, it's a knack. It's, it's not, um, it's not so, it's, it's not this incredibly difficult thing to do, but you have to really kind of recognize what's good research and what's not good research to see it in your own writing. And so I do recommend that you learn something about it first and don't just start writing. Got it. Yeah. Fantastic uh, advice. And Dr. Freeman, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. It was uh, fantastic. I, I learned a bunch of neat things. I, I read your papers and, uh, at the same time, I didn't get all of that stuff. So it's always helpful to talk uh, through some of these things. So I really appreciate uh, uh, you spending the time with uh, with me. And, and I know that other chiropractors out there are going to learn a lot from our conversation. So thanks for taking the time out and, and uh, speaking with me today. It was, it was a, a complete pleasure. You, you got me talking about my favorite uh, topic, which <laughs> as you can tell I can go on and on and on and on about. Um, and we like but, that here. We like that. <laughs> uh, but it was, a, it was an absolute delight to chat with you. And I appreciate what you're doing and um, uh, really enjoyed talking with you. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening to this episode of Chiropractic Science with Dr. Michael Freeman and stay tuned for more great episodes.